And our next speaker in, the, in this afternoon is Philip Schiele, and his talk is titled Discipline Saddle Programming. All right, everyone. Hey, um, yeah, my name is Philip. Um, my second time here at SciPy, we've presented two tutorials about CVXPy so far, including one on Monday that was about landing a rocket. So we had a simplified rocket landing problem that we solved using uh, CVXPy. And uh, today's talk basically will be an extension of that. So I've seen some familiar faces from our tutorial on Monday. That means, yeah, you really got hooked on optimization. Anyone else? I hope you also enjoy some optimization. And yeah, I think let's dive right into it. So this work, Discipline Cell Programming, was uh, while I was a visiting student at, at Stephen Boyd's lab at Stanford last year. And I wrote this together with uh, yeah, co-author Eric Luxemburg. Unfortunately, he could not be here today. Uh, so yeah, it will be just me presenting. Uh, a little bit about me. So I'm a PhD student in financial econometrics at LMU Munich. Uh, I also work a day job in finance. So uh, yeah, there I also do a lot of portfolio optimization uh, at a firm called Scalable Capital, where we empower everyone to become an investor. And they were kind enough to yeah, sponsor this trip. So thanks to them. Uh, all right, then, yeah, what is discipline saddle programming? So it's a domain-specific language for saddle programming. It's implemented as an extension to CVXPy. The method is based on a recent paper by mathematicians Yuditsky and Amorowski, and a natural use case is robust optimization. If none of these things mean anything to you, that's totally fine. In 25 minutes time, they hopefully will. So I mentioned it's an extension to CVXPy. So what is CVXPy, right? It's a Python embedded modeling language for convex optimization. And if you remember a convex function, and I've, I've drawn like a prototypical one here, yeah, x squared plus y squared, roughly speaking, is a function that always slopes upward, right? And that's the sort of function you can easily represent, model, uh, compose, and then solve the problem within CVXPy. More generally, a convex optimization problem is one where we minimize a function f naught here. And of course, it has to be a convex function, yeah, so an upward sloping function. There can also be constraints. So for example, we can have inequality constraints where we say some other convex function of x, our optimization variable, must be less or equal to 0. And we can also have equality constraints, but those need to be linear or affine. Yeah? So we have ax equals to b. It's not ax less or equal. Uh, for equal equality, we only can have these linear constraints. And we also have a formal definition here of what convexity means. If you think about a function and you draw a line between any points, that basically these points should be above the function. But if we just, as we just seen, basically it means upward sloping. Yeah? No negative upward curvature. So, if you've never seen CVXPy before, let's see how you would model this function that I just shown, yeah, x squared plus y squared, using CVXPy. So you import CVXPy, usually we use CP as an, as an acronym, and we define a variable x with, has, with uh, two dimensions here, and we define an objective, yeah, this is the function we wanna minimize, and yeah, the function is basically representable uh, as CP dot sum squares of x, which means I square the first component of my variable, then I square the second component and I sum them up. As we just seen, naturally, the, the minimum of that function is at zero. So the constraints that I've added here, that x must be between minus four and four, we don't really need them here, but it's just to show you the syntax of how you can add constraints to your, to your model. Then you define a problem yeah, by saying, I want to minimize my objective function subject to these constraints. Then you call solve and CVXPy will compile your uh, problem to a standard form, call an appropriate solver, and bring you back the solution and optimal value. And as you can see, it mixes in quite well with regular Python code, yeah? So you can ask, what is the value of my variable? You can call solve methods. So while it is a um, domain-specific language, it just feels like regular Python code, and every Python developer should feel right at home. So if you've never seen CVXPy, and you regularly solve optimization problems, which might even be convex, I think that's uh, a good place and you should be right at home. If not, yeah, maybe you can just appreciate how easy it is to go from some um, mathematical definition of a function that you want to minimize to a problem that you can actually solve accurately and very robustly. Okay, so maybe let's step even one step back and don't even consider a quadratic function, but an even simpler problem. Let's think about this linear program, and you might remember that from school or from university, 
where we have a, a function. Yeah, so we maximize 2x plus 2x1 plus 3x2. And we also have some inequality constraints. Namely, x1 must be less or equal to 5 x2 must be less or equal to 4, x1 and x2 together must be less or equal to 7. But, I mean, we haven't had our afternoon coffee yet, right, so we're still maybe a bit tired from lunch, so, well, we could now pull up our, you know, simplex algorithm and get started, how can we maximize that function, but maybe we're a bit lazy and think, well, you know, it would be, suffi uh, would be sufficient for me if I just had an upper bound. If I know this function with this constraint cannot be more than some value, maybe that, that's already good enough. So, yeah, you, you look at these constraints for a while and you think, well, if I just add together these inequalities, that almost looks like my objective, right? So if I look, uh, if I add all three inequalities together, I get, well, twice x1. I also get two times x2. And on the right-hand side, if I add them together, I get 16. So I, I have basically two times x2, x1 plus two times x2 less or equal to 16. That's almost an upper bound of my obje objective. I'm just missing one x2. So what can we do? Well, if we just multiply the second constraint by two, now what I get up, get out, if I sum together all of these inequalities, well, I still have the two x1s. I now have three times x2, and together that's less or equal to 20. So just by combining my constraints in that way and summing them up, I have basically recreated my objective on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, I get an upper bound on my objective. So that's good. I know whatever you know, the solution of this, of this maximization problem will be, it will not be more than 20. So you know, that's already quite good. But now kind of you're curious and think, well, what, how low can this bound get? Can I make this bound smaller, this upper bound? So I'm trying to, to solve the problem now instead of maximizing from below, and I try, try to minimize this upper bound from above. So you think, well, if I don't you know, just try to find, find random numbers that add up to the objective, but I just say the first one I multiply by y1, the second by y2, and the third by y3, then I try to fiddle around with these values so that they still add up to the objective, but such that the right-hand side becomes smaller. And if you think about it, now you want to minimize uh, across y1, y2, and y3, while they still add up to the um, objective. So this is what we see here. So we've seen I need y1 times x1 plus y3 times the coefficient we also get here. And that needs to add up to at least two. So that's the first new constraint I have. And similarly, for the second one, I, I know I get, I get one x2 here. I get another one here. So these two together must be at least three. But now what I want to do is I want to minimize over these, uh, these products here on the right. So if I had five times y1 plus four times y2 plus seven times y3, that's now the upper bound that I get, and I want to minimize that. Now we realize, okay, well, and of course I need non-negative y's, so otherwise I would flip the, the inequalities. But now you look at it and say, well, hmm, that looks awful, uh, an awful lot like a linear program, right? And I mean, we started with a linear program, now we kind of did this trick, and we again get a linear program. And indeed, what we just found is the so-called dual of the original problem. And um, you think, well, OK, what does that give us, right? So instead of solving one problem with, uh, with two variables, now I have another problem with three variables. Uh, and before, I had like two constraints. Now I have three plus these non-negativities. Um, excuse me, the other way around. Before I had three, now I have two. Um, so why, what did I get from that, right? So just, OK, I solve it from the other direction, but what, what does that give me? Well, actually, if you look into it, it gives you a lot of things. Um, for example, you can deduce from that some sensitivity of your original problems with your constraints. Sometimes it's also the case as, that this dual problem is easier to solve. But so far, I've only mentioned that it gives you an upper bound. So it would be nice if we can verify that we actually get the same objective value just coming from the other direction. And this is what's called strong duality. And we have a number of, of uh, conditions in which we can achieve that. And for example, for this problem, it holds, but it also holds for, for many, many other problems. So one thing you should notice here is that we started off with a maximization problem. But what we got out in the dual is a minimization problem. And that will become hugely important later for, for our saddle programming. So just keep in mind that when we have a maximization problem and we look at its dual problem, it is a minimization problem. OK, let's keep that in the back of our head and continue. As I've said, today is about saddle programming. So 
let's introduce the concept of a saddle function. We've seen before that a convex function has to be convex in all of its arguments. A saddle function, on the other hand, has to be convex if I fix some subset of its arguments, and it has to be concave if I fix the other variables, right? So let's look at this, uh, this chart here, this graph. This is basically x squared minus y squared. That means if I fix any value of y here, for example, at minus three, then I just get x squared with some offset. Likewise, if I fix x, for example, at x equals three, I get negative y squared with some offset. So indeed, if I fix one of the uh, arguments, it becomes either a convex or a concave function. And that's exactly the definition of a saddle function. And you can probably imagine that the point we care about is this one here, right? What's a prototypical saddle point. And a formal definition of a saddle point is given here. It's a point of, uh, of, on x uh, with x star y star such that if I choose any other x, then my objective function will become bigger. Likewise, if I choose any other y than y star, my objective function will be smaller. So let's look at this again. Starting from our saddle point here, if I have x equals zero and I can choose any other value for y and I want to maximize in y, well, unfortunately, my objective will only get smaller from there. So y has basically no incentive to deviate from here. Likewise for x, right? If y is here at, at y equals zero, then x will always get bigger yeah, if, I, if it deviates from x equals zero. So we indeed determined that what we see here as this unique point that, um, that seems interesting on this function is indeed a saddle point. Okay, where do saddle points uh, or saddle uh, functions come into play? Well, let's think about a so-called matrix game where we have two players. And generally, we have seen now there's some set I want to minimize over, so the convex variables, and some set of variables that I want to maximize over. So it makes sense or it, it can be helpful to, to think about this as a two-player game, right? So a, a regular optimization, minimization as a one-player game. Now we have introduced a second player, x and y here. So x wants to minimize and y wants to maximize. And in this simple matrix game, there's just a payoff matrix uh, C and x tries basically when multiplied with uh, C to, to minimize and y tries to maximize uh, the, the outcome. And it's basically a zero sum game because well, if x improves, then y uh, deteriorates in, in, in outcome. So let's look at a simple example here. So we have a, a payoff matrix C, one, two, th three, one. We have player x here who basically chooses the rows and we have player Y who chooses the columns. And let's think about how we could, yeah, maybe solve that problem. So maybe just X starts and says, well, I'm just picking the row first, and well, here's a one and a two, here's a three and a one, I wanna minimize, so I'll just pick the first row. Now it's Y's turn, and Y wants to maximize. So within the first row, well, two is bigger than one, so Y chooses the second column. Then it's X's turn again, maybe in this game, so within that second column, well, x actually refers, refers to second row. So now x chooses uh, x2 to equal one. And then basically the cycle continues and we would go in an infinite loop always around uh, our, our uh, variables and we would never converge to something. And that's a bit different from if you just look at a, at a simple minimization problem, a convex one, because you can actually come up with fairly straightforward methods. They might not be super fast, but if you think about our parabola again, right? If I just take the derivative, for example, if it's a differentiable function, I take a small step in that direction. Yeah, it's like a bowl, ball rolling down a bowl, and eventually we would find the optimum. But some simple strategies, they don't really work well for saddle games, and even for non-convex functions. So let's say a neural network that we want to fit. Um, it, um, we are generally quite good already. It's much harder to fit than a, a convex problem, but still, usually we can fit it in a way that we, we get good predictions uh, and, and relatively uh, yeah, good outcome. But for minimax neural networks, such maybe you've heard of the generative adversarial network, it's much harder to fit because you have two players again. And if one player becomes too good too fast, it's very hard for the other player to catch up. So also the tuning is even more hard there for, uh, for non-convex problems compared to convex problems. So we kind of understand that conceptually, these saddle problems, they seem quite a bit harder than our regular one-player games. Well, if we think back to our, um, to our duality example earlier, we saw that the maximization became a minimization. So what we can do if we look at the dual of this problem, actually 
instead of now having a min and a max, if we dualize the max part, basically, we then just have one minimization problem. So it's kind of surprising that this two-player game suddenly, by looking at the dual problem, becomes a one-player game. And this is a trick that's not really new. So Van Neumann and, and Morgenstern, they already discovered this uh, in, yeah, in uh, more than 70 years ago. And uh, I mean, probably not surprising to see Van Neumann and Morgenstern here. And also, the duality concept was developed in a conversation with, uh, with uh, Danzig, of course, the in inventor of the simplex algorithm. So yeah, that's a, a group at that time that really contributed quite a, uh, a lot to optimization research. So OK, this trick is available since a, since a long time. But what's the problem then, right? So the problem is doing this dualization yourself is quite error prone. It requires working knowledge of duality, and it's generally quite annoying. So DSP, our package, Discipline Settled Programming, allows us to explicitly formulate the problem in a high level way, and this dualization happens automatically in the background. So how do we specify this matrix problem uh, in, in DSP? Well, we define our variables, x and y, our matrix, yeah, just a NumPy array, and now we define kind of this DSP object, which is an atomic function of which we introduced a few, and you can only use this function to specify saddle functions or compose them to, to another one. And then we have an objective. Now it's not minimize, but minimize, maximize. And it always minimizes automatically in the convex variables and maximizes in the concave variables. We have constraints again, so the x and y, they must sum up to 1. Now we specify a saddle point problem instead of a regular problem. And we solve it, and we see, well, OK, indeed, the strategy that's an equilibrium here is some kind of mixed strategy. Yeah, that makes sense. We've seen that these pure strategies, they don't really give us an equilibrium. Now, yeah, how did we come up to write this package? There's this one form of optimization problems that's called the conic standard form. And it looks an awful lot like a regular linear program, right? So we have a linear objective and these linear constraints here, except that our x now is not necessarily just greater or equal to 0, but it's always in this cone. So we, have, we say x is in this k, which represents a cone. And these cones are actually very generic. So all of the linear programs, quadratic programs, second order programs, semi-definite programs, almost all convex programs can be written in a way that surprisingly looks very similar to this. Um, and what does it give us, this form? Well, it allows for separation of concerns. So we have a modeling language like CVXPy that helps you get you know, all of the problems you can specify in that language into the standard form. Then you have solvers which, say, which optimize for, given that standard form, how can I quickly solve the problem? And then you have researchers who, researchers who reason about this conic form and say, well, what could I do? What could I get from this conic form? For example, a few years ago, um, it came out how to uh, differentiate through a conic problem. And if you think about that, they didn't have to think about all the different con convex problems you might differentiate through. They just say, I just look at this conic problem, and then I have other tools that bring me my problem into that conic form. So that's kind of uh, a nice way. And you can think of this conic form as an API, basically, how modeling languages can talk to solvers and researchers can also contribute and improve algorithms and so on. And yeah, I mean, there, I try to say there's not too much math in here. And this slide is actually not for, for the purpose of going through it line by line. The only thing I want to show is that this here yeah, is basically a conic form that we can get through CVXPy. That's the first step that, that DSP does. So we get this conic form as, by using CVXPy as a tool. Then we use the research by Yuditsky and Numerovsky to apply their dualization trick, which they only showed for the general conic form. Then we have a simple problem at the end, which we then again represent as a CVXPy problem, but only a minimization problem. Right? And you can see again, this basically, this is a max and a min, and it turned into a min and a min. Yeah? So this is the trick that I showed earlier, turning a maximize into a minimize. OK, let's look at some example. We've seen the rocket tutorial on Monday. The slides and video will be uploaded soon. So uh, yeah, if you're curious how we did that, just look uh, at those. But for now, we say, well, we're choosing some velocity, position, or actually the, the thrust f to land our rocket. So we have some constraints to land accordingly. And we have a fixed fuel consumption called gamma. Uh, and then we can solve it. And, and that's what we did on Monday. So I'll not repeat it too much here. But what if, and, and it basically looked like this. So you apply your optimal vector of, of thrust at any given point in your discretized example. And you want to minimize the length of these vectors together. That's your objective, because that's uh, proportional to your fuel consumption. And here we used 150 tons of fuel. Well, 
what if gamma is not your actual fuel consumption at any given point, but the engineers tell you, well, it's just an average, and at any given point in time, it could be plus or minus 30%. So now you're not sure, well, the trajectory, how much fuel could it, at the worst case, be, right? So how can we model that now using DSP? So we just add a few lines to our rocket landing example. Namely, we say gamma is now not a constant, but we say gamma hat is a variable. We add constraints that say, on average, gamma hat should be gamma, but at any given point, gamma might be between 0.7 times gamma and between 1.3 times gamma. Now, we use DSP's atom called saddle inner to create the inner product of these vectors and create a saddle point problem to minimize uh, in, in, uh, in our regular variable, so we're still minimizing the fuel, but the second player, basically the gamma player, tries to maximize the fuel usage over these different values of, of gamma hat. And what we see is that the trajectory we get out is a bit more smoothed out. So we don't apply all of the thrust in the beginning because maybe at that height, the fuel consumption is the worst. So it would be bad if we apply full thrust in the beginning. And instead, we have the thrust applied, applied more smoothly throughout the whole uh, trajectory. And that's the point of basically how CVX, uh, CVXPi and DSP can be used for robust optimization. And we see from 150 tons of fuel, we're now at 170 tons, so quite a bit more. But if we calculate this worst case for the original path, it would be even more. So still, it's way better than the original path under this, this worst case. And I'm not going to too much detail about uh, robust constraints here, but in addition to looking at only the average case or the worst case, we can also say, well, I want the worst case maybe is too pessimistic, so I still want to minimize my original objective, but I want to add a constraint that says, in the worst case, the fuel consumption should not be more than 175 tons. And that gives me that something in between both, both of the paths. So basically, we're still trying to minimize our original objective, yeah, but making sure that even in the worst case, it's not too bad. And that gives us this, uh, yeah, basically, somehow a combination of the original path. And if we compare the models, we see that our original model only used 150 tons on the average, but it used 195 tons in the worst case. So you know, if you look only at your regular optimization problem and say, well, 150 tons of fuel usage, that's good, so I'll pack 160. Well, it would not really uh, be enough in the worst case. So really, this is a very easy tool to add a few lines to your model and say, well, what would happen in the worst case? Or maybe I just want the worst case to not be too bad, so I add a constraint, this robust constraint, and it gives me something in between. And there are many applications of this. We've already seen game theory, control, machine learning, where you basically say, well, what is the data is, is un measured with uncertainty, and what is the worst case there? Or finance, what is actually my covariance matrix that I estimated or my expected returns? Maybe I don't know them precisely, so what would be the worst case for my portfolio? So we've seen all that, and even this robust uh, bond portfolio optimization was the topic that, that started this whole research. But the point is that you know, when CVX Pi got started uh, in 2014 by, by Stephen Diamond, who's also here, he didn't even imagine the, the use cases that today we've seen uh, CVX Pi being used. So I hope here, presenting at, at SciPy this year, we will have uh, some yeah, discussions afterward where you, if you think, well, I have some minimax problem in my domain, and yeah, maybe this is something that, that could be represented using DSP, that's kind of where we should uh, start talking. And yeah, we're always happy to, to uh, listen to and maybe try to help implementing new models and find new applications. And if you want to get started, we are in GitHub CVX group slash DSP. The paper's on archive, and you can just pip install DSP slash CVXPy to get started. And if you're curious, there are more resources. There's a whole book by, by Stephen Boyd about convex optimization, going into all the details of duality. There's slides, videos, everything online, all available for free. Uh, CVXPy software, also available in other languages, uh, such as MATLAB, Julia, and R. Uh, there's a short course, a Jupyter book you can go through. And here's a nice video of uh, basically visually showing this duality concept that I just showed earlier. And yeah, if you want to look it up, the slides will be, avail will be made available uh, after the talk. All right, thanks everyone, and happy to hear your questions. Questions for Bob? The problems that you have shown uh, are all expressed in a rather small number of variables. Um, how high have you, uh, have you been able to scale uh, CVXPy up? So that's a very good question. In general, we, we say that 
CVX Pi, we have uh, people uh, use it with hundreds of thousands of variables, maybe, yeah, maybe even some, some small number of millions. If you have huge var problems with like billions of variables, maybe at that point you would need to uh, roll up your own servers, but we're continuously trying to improve the performance. This is one of the main criterions uh, that we have right now. So William here, for example, and I working on a Google Summer of Code project right now to make some forms of some problems uh, within CVX Pi up to 100 times faster. So really, we, we try hard. And uh, some of the core is written right now in, in C++. So we, we now added a, a, SciPy, a SciPy version of that. We're looking into adding a Rust version as well. So yeah, performance definitely is one of the highest um, uh, criterions for us as well. Uh, so yeah, you mentioned that your day job is a, a portfolio optimization, and in this presentation you said to use DSP for robust portfolio optimization. I was wondering if you had any examples quickly to you know, sure. sh show how we can use this. Like, uh, I think in, in portfolio optimization, right, so you may have some ideas about possible expected returns, but it turns out usually your estimates are pretty bad. Like, and if you just think, well, I just take them at face value, that's not so great usually. So if you now allow, well, what would be the worst case, right? Maybe it's not plus 7%, but maybe it's you know, somewhere in between 5 and 12% the, the return that it will have next year, right? So that's one way in the expected returns, but also in the covariances, right? If you say, well, I have a covariance matrix for my assets that I estimated, and you know, that might be an um, empirical covariance matrix or some shrinkage applied or some other methods of which there are many, but now you say, well, I'm not 100% sure about that. So what would be the worst case for my portfolio if I allow to have the covariance matrix in some, in, in some set around this, this matrix? So yeah, both of these are, I think, pretty, pretty important. We also have one for bond portfolios. So uh, yeah, and the examples are also uh, in our paper as well. So you, you can read it up there if you want more details. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, you mentioned a couple times that uh, finding the dual of your saddle problem is hard, or maybe just tedious, I wasn't sure. Um, could you give some sense of like why this is hard, and maybe some cases where it's easy, and some cases where maybe it's harder or unknown? So yeah, I mean, it's not, I guess it's not hard in a sense that people don't know how to do it. It's more, as you mentioned, it's tedious and, and error prone, and that's exactly the point of CVX Pi, for example. Like, CVX Pi cannot solve any convex optimization problem that you couldn't specify by hand and immediately pass it to a solver. It's more like, if you just want to iterate quickly and, and write in a high level, then uh, yeah, doing all of these, these transformations by yourself, it's just ex extremely tedious, and I think that's more of the, the, the benefit. You could, everything you can represent in DSP, you can also represent manually, but uh, I think it's more of the, the, yeah, the annoyance aspect of it. Hi, uh, thanks for the good uh, talk. So, um, so I'm interested in the, uh, your application to the uh, bond portfolio management. So uh, in your bond portfolio management modeling, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I will assume that your decision variables are holdings uh, of different bonds, maybe mm -hmm. weights. Mm -hmm. So um, is your modeling able to take into account turnover constraint? Let's say for this portfolio, for my portfolio rebalancing, I don't want my turnover to be more than 40%. So that will imply that uh, you need to uh, constrain the sum of the absolute values of the holdings. Yeah, yeah. That's a regular CVX Pi constraint. You can write it, add it so right to the I can, I can implement a constraint. Yeah. So the left hand side will be the sum of the absolute values of uh, decision variables. Yeah. That has to be less than, let's say, 40% or 50%. Yeah. That can be done in this. So you, you would, for example, you would say, I have yesterday's weights, I have today's weights, and I say, well, the, the, the sum of the absolute differences may not be more than 0 0.4, for example. That's a, a, a CVX Pi constraint that you can readily add. You can cp.apps of the sum, uh, of the difference, sorry, and, and sum up that, and yeah, add a constraint, uh, no problem. And it also work, uh, works with uh, DSP. Uh, one more question. So have you applied to other asset class and uh, uh, if you have done that, so uh, do you see any difference, uh, I mean, which asset class is more relevant to this kind of modeling? Yeah, so I guess, um, so what we, it, it, it was a bit different. We looked at bonds where we say, what is the worst case if the, if the yield curve, for example, changes? We looked at a more 
yeah, traditional asset classes like equities, where we say, what is if the covariance matrix changes? So there's ways, obviously, to combine them. We're actually working right now on a follow-up, where we say, well, what are some, some uncertainties that you should maybe take into account to improve your average performance? So yeah, we've looked at equities uh, and, and bonds so far, but uh, yeah, maybe others will follow. We talked about, like, maybe you can apply it to, to derivatives as well, but yeah. So yeah, there will be more. All right, thanks again.